Great. Well, clock's running, so we better get started. So it's very excited to be here in Kraski doing a robotics panel. Um, so I thought we could start by um, having you guys tell a little bit of your personal founding story. How did you guys get into startups and robotics? Perhaps starting with you, Helen? Well, it's, it's a long story, but I'll make it brief. Uh, uh, I've wanted to do robots since I saw R2-D2. Um, maybe BB-8 for some of you guys now. Um, and uh, I was at uh, grad school with Rod Brooks and Colin Angle. Uh, uh, Rod was actually a professor. They're both in the audience now and speaking later. And um, at the time, you couldn't really um, do robotics unless you stayed in academia or went to a government or NASA lab. And so starting a company seemed like it, it might have been a, a risk, but it seemed like the only way where we could pursue our passion for robotics. And then my new company, uh, iRobot is now a publicly traded company. I did it for 18 years. And uh, my new company, I founded it um, using uh, seed capital that I'd uh, made, it, made it iRobot. And um, I really saw that um, drones were the next thing. Like many of the problems with ground robots, you know, I think, uh, uh, I think it was Gil Pratt who said, um, uh, the problem with ground robots is the ground, but drones are like a magic technology that uh, you know get through many of the issues. So um, I started the new company specifically to do drones because I thought they, you know, they, they're going to be really big. Yeah, Dave. Sure. So, uh, so I spent my entire career at the intersection of uh, software and hardware. Started here at MIT, did undergrad and grad here, um, and then four startups before becoming a VC. Uh, every one of those startups was right at that kind of embedded systems intersection of hardware and software. Uh, so none of those were robotics, but by the time I uh, became a VC, it was sort of a natural extension to look for uh, other areas that kind of intersected those. So just real quickly, the startups were uh, Zipcar, where I built the embedded technology that went in the cars, found another company here in Boston called Ember. Uh, we did low power wireless uh, communication systems, both semiconductors and networking software. Uh, and then two energy management companies, Tendril and Adura. Right, so both of you have um, experience of taking something from angel to exit, right? So um, do you mind telling us a little bit of, of, about the story of what that journey looks like? Um, how did you get started? And what were the trials and tribulations along the way? And then what's the magic sauce to get, it, get you all the way to exit? <laughs> Wow. <laughs> That's a lot. That's a lot. Right? I really Question. only know about how, it's, want to know about the exit. Okay, so at, at, at iRobot, because at Sci-Fi we uh, haven't exited yet, uh, at, at iRobot, it was a, you know, we like to say uh, one of the longest overnight successes you'll ever see. We founded it in 1990. We didn't put the Roomba on the market till 2002. We didn't take any venture capital, which paid for uh, building the Roomba until 1998, eight years in. It was bootstrapped until then. And, um, you know, we started off, I think, without um, a great business plan. Uh, there was, uh, you know, space robotics was, you know, put the first robot steps on the moon. Um, it, that might be an idea that's coming back, by the way. <laughs> uh, but we might have been a little ahead of our time. Um, so we, we bootstrapped it. And um, so when we started raising venture capital, we could actually pay for development, but we needed that experience along the way of how to build a robot, how to get a product on the market, which we'd done in multiple industries, in, in the toy industry, and in the, um, in, uh, it, we've done development for uh, large uh, strategic partners, we've done military development, we just had uh, a robot going to the military labs, and, but that experience getting from you know, all the way through innovation to design to manufacture was really important, especially building stuff in the, you know, in, in the Far East. So it was a, a long story, so I can't really do it justice. I think maybe Colin will do a little more justice uh, in the afternoon session. Um, but, you know, one of the most important things, I think, is, is um, the persistence. Uh, you have to be persistent with the vision that you have to build mobile robots for a living, but being flexible along the way. When you see something isn't working, being able to switch and do the thing that will get you to that uh, end goal of getting a uh, product on, on, on the market. Um, you know, every founder needs to really look at what's best for their company at their particular 
technology with their particular market. At, at, at iRobot, we really felt that we wanted to be an independent company, so we never really tried to do a, a, an acquisition because what happened with robot acquisitions in the past was a large company would buy the robot company and use those wonderful, brilliant engineers to do something else like you know, wireless networking. And so it wasn't pushing the field along. I mean, myself and my two business partners really wanted to work on pushing the robot field along. I don't think that's the case today. I think companies that are going into robotics as a startup, there's a lot of venture capital available, so you don't have to bootstrap it unless you're really in a gestation period where you're developing you know, the idea still. And um, you, you, you might choose to do an, an acquisition as an exit because of the large companies that really want the robot brains and that robot technology and that robot product to be part of their uh, ecosystem. So, Andy, I know you have many experiences with exits um, between Amber and also your portfolio companies. Um, would you mind starting with Amber and talk about what that journey looked like? And it, it's been a little while, right? So, has things changed? And when you have an exit event, what does it look like now? Yeah, I think fundamentally exits and getting to an exit still looks pretty similar between uh, when I started Amber and exited it and what, what an exit looks like today. Um, I think, you know, Generally, what you want to be aiming for is, uh, is an independent standalone company. I think the best exits, whether they're going to be IPOs uh, or acquisitions, uh, are, are always optimized if you've built a standalone uh, healthy business. Um, so you know, certainly as a VC, I, I always look for teams that look like they're doing that rather than optimizing simply for uh, an acquisition. Um, and so, you know, I think Ember, Ember was a long story. It was, uh, I don't know, nine years or so start to, uh, start to exit. Um, and as with all startups, there's lots of uh, twists and turns. When we started, we were strangely a software company. Um, and we ended life as a semiconductor company, so that's a serious twist. Uh, try going back to your investors and saying, yeah, that three million that we raised, we actually need 30, and we're going to build chips now. <laughs> it's, a, it's a fun conversation. Um, but, you know, ultimately, uh, we found product market fit um, with our chips in the energy management space, um, and that took us to high volume production, um, and ultimately we sold to a company called Silicon Labs, um, who still produces those chips today. Um, but again, the arc, if I look at it from, from the perspective of, of our portfolio companies, looks very similar, right? You need to, uh, you need to demonstrate that you've got a product that people really like, um, that they're paying you a healthy amount of margin for it, um, and that there's a good market, and you're gonna find yourself a good exit. Now, with both uh, iRobot and Amber, it's a number of years from one end to the other, right? Um, now, Josh in an, uh, from Lux Capital in, in an earlier uh, panel mentioned that there is an abundance of capital today. Uh, was that the case while you were building these businesses? <laughs> Oh, at, 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 at iRobot, no. We didn't even try to go after venture capital in 1990. And if we had tried, we would have been rejected point, point, point blank. Um, uh, because it, it, wasn't the, it wasn't as much the thing. There wasn't the entrepreneurship centers like you work at today to help uh, people start up. And um, there wasn't as much capital. And it wasn't typical. You know, everyone... The advice would have been, go out and get some experience before you start a, a company. Today, I think that age discrimination has, has, has gone away. Or well, experience discrimination, I should say. There's age discrimination, <laughs> yeah. but for us. Yeah, yeah. So um, now, you know, because of the successes, for, you know, when you have... Um, uh, you know, people just coming out of, out of school, uh, you know, their first jobs, starting a company because they have that experience with what's going on in the technology field right now, and they want to design the technology that they need. And, um, you know, I think venture capitalists and investors have, um, you know, they, it, it's, it's really a different environment. So for iRobot, it was... We didn't try for the first eight years, and when we tried, I can honestly say I've been rejected by many of the v major VCs across the, the country, and um, the great feeling was when they started to, you know, once we took it public, when they could come to me and say, Hel Helen, we were, we were wrong, and, um, you know, that was a good investment, um, and what other robotic technology should we be investing in now? Because it's really changed the, the field from, uh, you know, that's too science fiction. My partners would kill me as feedback that you know, I sometimes got to um, people recognizing that robotics is going to play an essential, essential component in 
almost every major industry, and I, I say that without hesitation, but we know whether it's transportation or agriculture or mining or, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it's really everything is getting more automated, and it can be in the, in the manufacture, but it can also be in the logistics, it can be in servicing. Uh, there's just so many uh, applications for robotic technology. Yeah, I mean, I, I started Ember uh, at the beginning of 2001, and we raised our Series A in uh, August of 2001. For any of you who are old enough to remember the dot-com crash, that was in a few months uh, after it. So I think here in Boston, we were one of fewer than five Series A's that quarter or something. It was, uh, it was not a good time to raise money, but uh, um, I think it built, uh, built persistence, shall we say. <laughs> persistence, then. Okay, persistence. All right, persistence so... Persistence is what you need. <laughs> Um, intersection of hardware and software. So Andy, your investment thesis is you look for the same things that interested you throughout your career, um, you know, wireless, you know, uh, smart grid. What do you see are the key differences in how these startups are able to build up um, their team and grow and kind of just really find a path to greatness in terms of challenges and timelines? Sure. I mean, I think a lot has changed in the world of hardware development uh, in the last, you know, 15, 20 years, right? There's a vastly better uh, rapid prototyping tools. Um, so, in fact, I also invest in those. One of the areas I invest in is 3D printing. Uh, I'm an investor in both desktop metal here in Boston uh, and in carbon uh, back in uh, San Francisco. And both of those are 3D printing companies that are helping to make the leap um, into manufacturing, right? Actual tools that you can use to both prototype but then also manufacture. Um, and that's been a huge change uh, in hardware development over the course of time. And so, you know, today I think getting yourself to a working prototype uh, can be done on a lot less capital um, and a lot faster than it could have been done uh, 20 years ago. Right. But then the same tools that are available for hardware, they are just as good tools for software, and software is still faster. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what do True. we do about that if we're really hardware geeks? Well, you know, luckily I see lots of uh, folks innovating across the entire ecosystem, taking every single one of those steps and things that take still too long today, whether it's fabricating a PCB and getting components assembled on it, uh, things like that, and they're, they're working to make those even faster. Um, so I see a lot, of, uh, a lot of positive progress in terms of both the manufacturing and the prototyping side. Uh, but there's no doubt, you know, you're not going to just press the button like it is on software and get a, get a piece of thing compiled into hardware. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, hardware is hard. Hardware is hard. And but, you know, you you will always have to get your hands dirty. You always have to worry about, um, you know, even after you've designed it and got it all working and got through. You know, I, I like to say amateurs talk about design, professionals talk about thermal noise and system integration. <laughs> um, once you got through all that. Even after that, you always have to worry about supply chain issues. Once at iRobot, the price of ABS plastic goes up, and you know, the longshoremen strike, and you know, there's all these things that can get in the way of getting that product into the hands of the, of, of the customer. But the good news is the hardware also provides the moat because it's harder for your competition uh, to, to, to catch up. Once you have the product tested in the real world with real customers, you're getting that feedback in, and you're creating that virtuous cycle of investing in the next generation. So although it can be a detriment on, on, on the front end, if you've got something special, I, I think it can be a, a real advantage uh, for your company and um, to keep the competitors out. Um, in, in addition, being able to patent, you know, kind of the combination of the hardware and the software. So yeah, exactly. There's natural moats built into uh, hardware businesses. <laughs> yeah. So um, I have lots of questions, but I do actually want to get to one thing Helen wanted to talk about, which is cool robots. <laughs> so let's talk about cool robots. What cool robots are you guys building right now? And same for your portfolio companies. Well, I always love to talk about cool robots, and uh, at Sci-Fi Works, where um, uh, we're actually building a tethered drone that flies 24-7, um, uh, and we routinely fly them hundreds of hours at a time, so it's very different from any other drone out there. We recently did the trifecta of um, Boston um, cool experiences. We were at the start of the marathon, we were at Sail Boston flying the drone, and we were at the 4th of July. So, um, you know, from that vantage point, we were, we've got stunning vistas of it all, but we were also helping public safety um, 
you know, make sure that everything was working according to plan, that everything was okay. So, but, you know, that's a really good feeling. We also have the, these persistent drones deployed with the military, and I, I can't say too much about that, unfortunately, but they're exactly where you would expect them to be. And I was talking to um, uh, special forces operators, and, and they told me they are out there that definitely have saved, saving lives, and they're really a high priority now for the um, uh, for the, uh, op the commander of Operation Iraqi Freedom. They're, they're getting such good um, demand signal from, from the field. So a, a very exciting time um, to be building drones that are different from what's commercially available. Because you know, if you're doing what's commercially available um, as a startup, that's that's not really where you want to be. But uh, you know robot technology that um, pushes the boundaries in what people think a, a, a robot or a drone can do. Cool robots. Cool Andy. robots. Uh, sure, lots, lots of examples. Um, so one, that, one that's one of my favorites is a company called Zipline, also in the drone space. Uh, they're in drone delivery, um, which obviously a lot of people think is the future, but has probably a ways to go before it's delivering packages to your doorstep. I think it's the future. Absolutely, it's definitely the future. Um, but uh, what they did was they found an application where they can get going right away, and so they're delivering medical supplies uh, and blood transfusions uh, in emerging market countries. So today they're live in Rwanda, um, and their drones are dropping uh, supplies at clinics. Um, so that's been a great one. We were uh, seed investors as they made the transition uh, into drones. Um, so it's been great to watch that arc and see them active with the system in Rwanda. Um, another one you heard a little bit about already was Abundant Robotics. Um, this, is, uh, this is a company that's revolutionizing uh, orchard agriculture and starting with, uh, with apple picking. Um, and so they've built a robot that, again, is really interesting to see because it's, I think it was really only became possible very recently. Obviously, the end effector was a huge piece of that, uh, which you heard about. Uh, but also just vision systems and things like that had to get to a particular point where you could do things like identify, is this apple ripe or not? Um, and that's, uh, that turns out to be a harder trick than, uh, than it sounds like. Um, so those are, those are just a couple examples of some, some cool robots that we've invested in. Right, so I'm gonna take two seconds and just dive in on Zipline because I just saw the coolest video from you guys, mm -hmm. Helen, on medical delivery, right? Yep, so yep. when you see an application you like and it seems like someone else has done it someplace else, uh, how do you think about that as a, you know, any kind of startup anyway? I think it's great validation that it's a real application <laughs> if multiple people are working on it. If you're the only person working on something, you gotta scratch your head and wonder, why am I the only person? <laughs> Is it a real problem? <laughs> I, I mean, with Amazon, Google, and many others also working on drone delivery, I think it, I mean, to me, it's a foregone conclusion that we will have um, deliveries by, by drone, um, you know, probably not down the city streets for, <laughs> or to the oh, top wow. of apartments in New York City for a long time, but in rural areas, in hard-to-reach areas, um, uh, and even in, in, in the suburbs to get the, those supplies, your groceries or medical pharmacy supplies you want really quickly. It, 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 you know, to, to, to me, the technical challenges are not um, insurmountable. They're not all done yet, but they're not insurmountable. There's some airspace issues, but they're all, um, you know, the drone community has been um, working those together with the FAA, and, uh, you know, I, I don't see any real showstoppers for, for that. Okay, so we're coming up on time. I'd like you guys to give 30 seconds of wisdom to any aspiring robot startup people out there. What would be your 30 second word of advice for them? Uh, first, make sure you're working on a problem that matters. Um, I think the number one problem I see when I talk to robotics entrepreneurs uh, is that they think robots are cool and they're building something that's not actually solving a, a pressing, urgent need. So make sure your customers are screaming for uh, screaming for a solution to a problem and then go solve that. I, I tell people the story of one of the reasons I invested in Abundant was when I started calling uh, apple growers, they were, I literally had to hold the phone away from my head because they were <laughs> screaming so loudly about the urgency of the problem uh, of getting labor to pick, uh, to pick apples up in Washington. And so uh, that's a very different conversation as a VC than uh, kind of somebody saying, oh, yeah, you know, that's kind of cool, like, yeah, it might, might, might be good. We'd probably roll that out if it existed um, versus, like, holding the phone away, listening to someone screaming about how urgent this problem is. So that's, that's probably my number one piece of advice. I would say that um, robotics can get complex really fast, so keep it simple. Um, uh, 
you know, you might design a wonderful device, but you won't be able to get onto the market at the price point that your customer base can, can, can afford. And, uh, you know, there's all different price points for different customer bases, but, um, you know, you'll have design engineers say, oh, we should just do this, we should just do this. You probably should leave a lot of it to the next generation and really keep it simple. Yes. All right, that's a wrap. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.